Please now give a warm welcome to our guest, Robert Edgers. And also to Victor Parak, who will be our host for tonight. And have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, a rough outline of how the following approximately two hours will go. Uh, the whole thing will be divided into, let's say, three parts. In the first part, um, um, we uh, talk with uh, Robert about his um, uh, about the way how he uh, prepares movies, screenwrites, um, prepares the drafts, uh, all the way through the filmmaking process till the final product. Uh, then uh, we are joined by Jerin, who's already uh, with us, and he will uh, extend the insight into their mutual cooperation. And the final part will be uh, devoted to you, the audience, uh, where you will be uh, free to ask your questions with our guests, answering them. Uh, throughout the whole program, we have a selection from the storyboards and various uh, visual, uh, let's say, prep stuff for uh, the lighthouse. Uh, the, the storyboards are for all of uh, Robert's movies. We also have a couple of uh, excerpts from the lighthouse that we are going to discuss in the second part. And uh, the respective parts will be divided or introduced by the trailers, as was this uh, very, very beginning. So uh, let's let's get into it. Uh, I would probably start with like the most uh, general question regarding your uh, your creative process. Uh, maybe if you could give us an insight into how detailed the whole process is and how much time it actually takes, um, whether you prefer to discuss any of any particular movie or whether this can be anyhow generalized. Well, <clears throat> uh, you know, everything is, every, every film is different. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. If we're, uh, I'm just, oh. <laughs> if we're gonna um, sort of start at the beginning, um, you know, uh, The Witch was something that took uh, five years to, to make. Um, it was four years to get the film financed and the entire time I was uh, reworking the script. Um, it took about, uh, you, you know, nine months to write a first draft with a lot of um, research. And then, um, uh, you know, it was about a year um, altogether developing it with um, Lars Knudsen and, and Jay Van Hoy, the producers of the film. Um, and but then, uh, you know, during the years that it took to get the film financed, like I, I continued to hone hone the script. Um, so, um, so yeah, and and sometimes uh, the idea comes um, as uh, an ap as just with atmosphere and some images. Uh, sometimes I have a story I want to tell. Uh, the the witch was a, a bit of. Uh, it was, was sort of, I, I had made a couple short films that weren't terrible, finally, and there were some people in New York who were interested in potentially uh, developing a feature film, and I wrote a couple feature scripts uh, that were too esoteric for anyone to want to make, even if they had a little bit of promise, and I realized that I needed to write a genre film as an American filmmaker if I was going to get a film financed, because it's different than... Europe, there's no, you know, ministry of arts and culture. There's, you know, you, you, you have to, your films have to make a profit if you want to make more films. Uh, and um, so I, I thought, what's, how can I write a genre movie uh, that, where I can be myself? And, uh, and I'm from New England, and witches are the ar archetypal New England spook, and I had thought a lot about, uh, about, which is growing up in, in New England, and so, um, you know, I started to work on it. 
uh, in a recent article that the New Yorker did on, on you and your work, uh, they quote Chris Columbus, uh, who was an executive producer on both The Witch and The Lighthouse, as saying, I've never seen such detailed storyboards from a director ever. Are you aware uh, of the fact that your approach is uh, really that exceptional? What is, your, what is your experience with storyboarding and maybe other filmmakers? Well, I mean, in initially, I was pretty allergic to storyboards because um, the most of the, the directors that I really admired uh, didn't do a lot of storyboarding. And, uh, you know, Herzog, for example, like totally hates storyboarding and, uh, and says that if you storyboard, you cannot produce images that are better than kitsch. Uh, and, and so Jaren and I originally would just shot list stuff, um, and, which worked well. And, but but when, when we did The Witch, I had so, a few sequences with visual effects and special effects and animals and in the beginning of the film with uh, extras, um, crowds. And so in order to make sure that all the departments were aligned, uh, I felt that I, certain sequences needed to be storyboarded. And uh, well, this 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 is these are done by me, uh, and uh, and and basically this we this early sequence, aside from the fact that it, um, it was complex for us at that time and that stage in our career with the crowds, we also didn't have a lot of money to build the entire meeting house. So we through these storyboards, we discovered that we only needed to build like two thirds of the floor. Um, and also, I knew that we weren't going to be able to afford enough period footwear for everyone. So I was also trying to devise a way to tell the story, you know, without compromise, that would not show pe very many shoes. <laughs> uh, so that was part of the reason why we, 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 uh, I, we storyboarded this sequence. So The Witch, we really just did the beginning. We did the very end uh, uh, of the film. And then uh, I think I think I storyboarded the sequence with the the hair, I think, and I think that's it. Thank you. Um, would you, as a as a result, would you say your screenplays are uh, detailed and thorough, as opposed to giving just a very general outline of what's supposed to happen, or did it perhaps vary <laughs> well, from project to project? I mean, yeah, I think I think my scripts are as one actor put it who turned down a role in the northmen they're overwrought um, and but and i and there is a lot of description i think with the witch for you know uh, i was trying to really capture the atmosphere so that i could you know convince someone that this movie was worth making and it's something that i've kind of continued to do i mean if you're a screenwriter for hire you generally write a script that has it has a little bit more space for the director to, to come up with their own thing, but I tend to be uh, pretty specific. But I would definitely say, and I'm just, well, this will come into more detail when I'm talking with Jaren, that oftentimes I'm just writing a story. And, I'm, and, and like there are certain moments where I really can visualize, like this is the motion picture that I'm going to make. This is the visual language of the film. But, but sometimes uh, as I'm just trying to get the story and understand the characters and what's happening, I picture it with bad television coverage, which is, you know, my worst nightmare, but it is how I, like, sometimes picture it when I'm writing it. And so there, there becomes a new process of rewriting the script when I'm working with, with Jaren. Sometimes I don't actually even change the page, but, but we find a way to kind of sometimes restructure the order of certain story beats um, and, 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 or condense story beats in order to... Uh, make it more cinematic, frankly. Um, you know, because sometimes the way I write it, it would take like a million shots where we only want to do two or three. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, I, I think if if you if if anyone here likes the visual language of my movies, you know, like it, it, you know, they wouldn't like it without Jaren. You know, I, you know, my you know my friend Ari Aster like. You know, those, those all the shots are pretty much his, uh, but but this comes through a deep collaboration with me and Jaren, the, the 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 cinematic language of my films. Um, if we stick with the screenplays for a bit more, um, 
How many people get involved during the script writing stage? My naive idea would be that it's just the author, you or your collaborators, we'll get to that a bit later, working with your brother or Sean, but are there other external voices that are involved in the script writing stage or do they come in later? Yeah, no, I mean, you have, um, I have got my creative producers and, uh, and the, uh, on The Witch and all the films, but then uh, you also have the studio. Um, even if even if you're doing a situation, even if you have a situation where you're fortunate to have final cut, you know you you have the notes from the people who are financing your film, and you're obligated to, in my opinion, to to listen to them. If you, you don't have to agree with them, but you have to you know uh, hear it. And the other thing is is that you know it's it's um, you know it's easy to have your head up your butt. And um, and so it's and so it's great to have an outside perspective, even if it's stuff that you don't agree with, because it challenges you. Um, you know, and 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 often, uh, you know, if a lot of people have notes about a certain scene, there's probably something wrong with it, even if it's not what they're identifying. There's probably something that you're you're not doing a good job of articulating. Uh, your intention there as a writer, if, if everyone's got something to say about it. Um, yeah. Uh, sticking to the uh, head in the butt metaphor, would you say you used to do more of that, for example, at the times of The Witch, as opposed to the future projects? Have you like evolved in this I, sense? I'm, which is I'm probably a little bit less defensive now because I'm used to uh, to hearing it, you know? And uh, I, th I mean, actually, with, with The Witch, I, so, so I wrote this script... And, and uh, Louise Ford, my editor, who's been working with me as long as Jaren, she had worked with Jay and Lars, who in their company, Parts and Labor, was like the Corvette of indie producers in New York at the time. And like, that's who I wanted to work with. Everyone wanted to work with them. And I, I just felt that the script was not ready to send to them. And she had, she had worked with them uh, as an assistant editor on a Julia Lochtev uh, film, and uh, she gave it to them without my permission, because she said you're never going to, She like, when she admitted it, she said that you're never going to think the script's ready enough. Um, and so thankfully they liked it, and they wanted to uh, work on it with me, uh, but but at the time the, the film was in five acts, and it followed each of the family, if you haven't seen The Witch, I'm very sorry, uh, this is probably super boring, but it followed each of the family members uh, and then finally ended with Thomason's story. And they said, look, this could be the best way to tell the story, but we are probably never going to be able to finance it um, because nobody knows who the fuck you are. Um, uh, so we strongly would, we, we would like you to strongly consider having a central protagonist to the film. Uh, and I was like, they're trying to ruin my movie and blah, 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 which was so naive because they, they absolutely were not. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, but anyway, they were right. And I think, you know, where the movie doesn't totally work sometimes, it's, I think you can see remnants of the, the original structure. Um, but yeah, at the time, I was defensive about that kind of stuff, even though it's very helpful. Uh, you previously mentioned that uh, you are drawn to uh, archetypes, archetypal characters in the stories that you tell in your movies. Uh, if we fast forward to the current days, do the characters in Nosferatu, which uh, you are in pre-production stages of at the moment, uh, archetypal characters for, for you as well? What would be their like universal or timeless message? Well, um, you know... You'll have to see the film, <laughs> uh, and and also you know seven nine thirteen knock knock knock, which is how they say touch wood in Iceland. But you know until I'm directing the movie like day one, it, it's not happening, and the movie's fallen apart twice. So I feel very superstitious about it. So we'll see we'll see how many beers in you can, like it takes to get me to talk more about Nosferatu. <laughs> Cheer, cheers. Yeah. Let's go back to the previous screenwriting okay. project. Um, the Witch was uh, a screenplay that you did yourself, but on The Lighthouse, on, you collaborated with your brother. Then, as, as already mentioned, Sion was a co-writer on, um, co on The Northman. 
why did you decide to take other authors on board? Was that a practical reason, or yeah, it was. It was, it was initially it was necessity. I mean, the th like um, I had, growing up, I'd always done one thing after another, and that was it. And and it and sometimes it like I ruined years of my life, like working on a play or a screenplay that like sucked, and I would abandon it. Uh, but but I couldn't do more than one story at the same time because I was. I mean, immature, but I but I took it very seriously and passionately. Uh, but but basically, um, you know, this this industry uh, or this craft or whatever you want to call it, it's really tough. It's really competitive, and there's like a lot of moving parts, and things are complicated, and things don't turn out how you expect. So I've dis discovered quite early uh, after the witch, you have to have a lot of pots on the stove, and and in order for me to like get out the amount of content that I need to survive, like I have to have co-writers. Uh, so it, after The Witch, I was in the process of trying to make some big films that I was the sole author of, and they were not happening. And, uh, and basically, I've told this story so many times, but basically, my, like, rewind to when uh, year three of no one wanting to make The Witch, and I'm feeling like I'm hopeless about life. <laughs> and my brother said, I'm, I'm working on a screenplay that's a ghost story in a lighthouse. And I was very envious of the idea. Uh, and then he told me wh what it was, and it was like some guys like refurbishing a lighthouse in Maine with his dog. And I was like, Ugh. you know, whatever. I was like, good luck. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and then um, a, a couple months later, I said, how's that going? He's like, you know, it didn't really amount to anything. And I said, can I just steal the concept? And he said, sure. Uh, so then I had the first ideas of what became uh, The Lighthouse. And, um, and, and it was mainly just crusty, dusty, musty, rusty, black and white, you know, the, the sweaters, the pipe, the cigarette smoke, the back boxy aspect ratio, but not really a, a story. Um, and then fast forward to me not being able to have the kind of control I want over these studio films that I'm trying to make. Uh, and I called my brother up and I said, let's do The Lighthouse together. So we were working on The Lighthouse while I was trying to make some larger films that were, I was just drowning in. And eventually uh, I, I pulled the plug and we uh, made The Lighthouse. Um, yeah, and then with The Northman, um, even, even if I had all the time in the world to, to write The Northman by myself, I desperately wanted to have an Icelandic co-writer because, you know, uh, you, you know whether or not you like Vikings or not, as, as an Icelander, you know the saga characters that you're literally directly related to. It's just, like, part of the cultural in inheritance. And, 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 and then, you know, I mean, Sean's a, a, a genius and has a special knack for this kind of mythical storytelling, so I was uh, very honored that he wanted to work with me. Uh, one of the things that uh, I find uh, fascinating and impressive about Sean's writing is how condensed it is. And uh, given the fact how, um, how many things you managed to condense into your movies as well, I was wondering whether that was an aspect of his writing that uh, you could relate to, and maybe how aware you were of uh, his uh, literary output before no, I mean, I, I mean, I was aware of his writing, which is why I um, went. To, I mean, <clears throat> I met him at a dinner party, and I had no idea who he was. Um, and uh, at Bjork's house, um, <clears throat> and she, and I, I didn't, had not met Bjork either. Um, but she, she um, invited Shion because she thought we would get along, even though she'd never met me before. Um, but I, I have to say. Bjork's good at hooking people up, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist. Because I, so I, we met, and I said, oh, you're a writer. And he's, I, I said, what, you know, what do you write about? He said, well, I just finished a, a book about witchcraft in 17th century Iceland. And so, yeah, so then we, we, we hit it off. And then I read his stuff when I came back to the States and was completely, uh, completely blown away. But I think, um, you know, as far as, like, condensing, I mean, that's part of what, like, you know, poetry is, is taking one sentence to describe a, a, a paragraph. But, but I think also uh, the sagas, the Icelandic sagas that, you know, inspired the kind of storytelling that we were trying to put on screen is, um, 
you know, it, it, it is dry and, and it's stoic and it's minimalist in, in the way that the characters speak and, and you know, and, and so it's, you know, it's part of the tradition. Uh, during the preparations, uh, you are known for undergoing extensive research into the uh, eras, contexts of your projects. We are currently looking at a selection of images and a lookbook that uh, you yourself put together before filming uh, The Lighthouse. Uh, could you perhaps give us an insight into this part of the uh, pre-production or the, or the writing stage? Uh, at, at which point do you dive into the research, start searching for images, and what you do with them afterwards? Who gets to see all of this? Um, it, 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 I, I usually take about a month uh, of hard research before I start writing, uh, just so that I have some juicy things to, 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 to know and to, and to utilize. But I'm, I'm, const I'm constantly researching and writing at the same time, all the time. Um, it's good to sort of get some s stuff down on the page and get a sense of the story before you know everything, uh, and, but then you can always go back and fix it. Uh, you know, there's nothing important about being historically accurate if you're doing a, a historical piece. Like, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, you know, I can think of many great films that don't, that aren't historically accurate, that are excellent, but this is something that I like to do. Uh, it, it, it eliminates choices because I don't have to like think about what is the perfect chair that captures someone's like personality and essence. It's like, this is the chair that existed, and so that's the chair that we need, done. Um, and, uh, and, and also my, my, uh, my collaborators know like this is the bar. It's historically accurate, so everyone knows what the bar is. Uh, and, you know, and, and I just enjoy it. You know, I just enjoy it. I personally enjoy it. Um, <clears throat> so, and, uh, yeah, and, 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 and also with, you know, with these films, it, it, like The Witch and The Lighthouse that were so contained, I got to kind of have, like, these dollhouses in my imagination that I could play in, which was also really fun for the writing. Uh, but, yeah, but then these lookbooks, <clears throat> you know, go to the heads of department and start and say... Like, you know, this is, this is what I'm thinking, this is what it's about. Sometimes I'm literally saying, like, that's the exact tea kettle. That was something for the, the, the lighthouse, the iron kettle that he smashes uh, Defoe in the face with. Like, I was looking for, like, that exact kettle. But, but, all, but I also love, like, part of what's the best thing about filmmaking is the collaborative process. So as much as I, like, really have a vision, as people like to say, uh, or know what I want, um, you know, how much better is it when someone can take your idea and make it better? Um, you know, so so certainly, you know, the, you know, when I bring these lookbooks to Craig Lathrop, the production designer, and Linda Muir, my costume designer, you know, they'll say, this is great, we love this, this is great, but, you know, have you thought about this lapel instead? Like, or have you thought about this door latch instead, whatever? Um, and, and, it, and it's great. Uh, what about the actors? Do you show them the um, initial uh, lookbooks as well? Yeah, or? because because it you know it, it hopefully gets them excited and they can see the the world uh, more clearly. Yeah. Uh, would you say you are disciplined as an author? I'm not cruel, but I'm but sure. I'm asking because um, the the research is always very impressive and very thorough. And uh, I mean, I don't have anything else to market besides, aside from that, so I have to make a big deal about it, you know. So, what, what does your bedside table look like? Is it overflowing with books? Yeah. Um, do you think it helps to be disciplined and focused in order to create like a hallucinogenic atmosphere in the movies, or do you have to be somehow wild as well in order to create that? I think that I've spent, I spent my, my 20s and early 30s turning someone a little bit out of control into someone very disciplined. Um, when you were writing The, the Lighthouse, uh, apart from other sources, you studied diaries of lighthouse keepers from 
years before. Um, what other materials did you get to study, you and your brother, at, at that time? Or is it just you researching and your brother contributing with the writing? No, I mean, we're, we're both researching a ton. Uh, but I think, I mean, you know, the, the diaries are is partly to, <clears throat> for the dialogue, and uh, there's a Maine-based author, Sarah Orne Jewett, and she uh, wrote her, her main stories in dialect, and she would interview sea captains and farmers and 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 uh, and, and write their dialect semi phonetically uh, in in her work uh, and it was incredibly helpful and my wife found someone who wrote their dissertation on dialect in Sarah Orne Jewett that became like a, a real key in order to figure out how to you know make these characters talk this way you mentioned a number of your frequent collaborators uh, simply said what is the advantage of that of uh, working with the same bunch of people on movies that are varied one from another? I mean, <laughs> survival. Uh, I, you know, I was certainly with The Northman, I, you know, I never could have made a film on, on that massive scale without the fam familiarity of these people who we all know how we each other work and we speak the same language and we have the same, you know, shorthand, which is a cliche that everyone uses, but it's very true, you, you have it. I mean, it's been such a joy to like, you know, go to the woods uh, outside Prague with Jaron and Craig and just, you know, know, know how we behave and, and what we're looking for. Uh, the New Yorker in the article I've already mentioned mm. uh, called The Northman probably the most accurate Viking movie ever made. I mean, that's a fairly low bar, but yes. <laughs> but still, is this anyhow satisfying for, for you to hear this? Yeah, I mean, yeah, because, because well, I mean, this, like, making the most accurate, like, Western or Victorian movie is, like, pretty hard to do, because there's plenty of them. Uh, but, 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 but it, you know, but they're, you know, really, there's, like, one Icelandic movie b based on Gisli's saga from the early 80s or late 70s that's f attempts to be accurate, and that's, Basically it. Um, so uh, so it was enjoyable to to, to do something. Of, of course, you know, in a, a few years, archaeology is going to advance, and our understanding of Viking culture is going to uh, you know advance, and that and the movie will be less accurate. Um, as mentioned before, atmospheres are definitely important for your filmmaking. And I would like to know what are your strategies when incorporating music and sound design into your movies? Um, Whether there are any. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that, this is, that's its own two hours. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I like a kind of overwhelming sound design so that you really feel uh, in it. Uh, you know, the lighthouse is something that is like, pretty over the top, and you, I try to mix it so that it doesn't sound cartoony. I don't know if I always succeed, but we, we try to get it as big as it can be before it starts to sound cartoony, but you know, you wanna, like, you know, every crack and creak in, in the chair tells you something about, you know, the, the world, and trying to get the, uh, the, the water pump in the sink to sound as miserable and horrible as possible, like, you know, Takes a takes a lot of effort, uh, and um, you know, and uh, I mean, but you know, and every score is a little different, and they all demand different things. But I'm, you know, I'm very, I'm very uh, involved with 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 all of it. You know, I, you know, feel free to ask me more specific questions because that wasn't the finest yeah, answer. Of all this time. question might not be that specific, but it might lead us to more specific ones. Uh, First of all, some filmmakers tend to play music on set to set the mood. Have you ever tried that? Or is it something you would want to try? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, <clears throat> I, I, I listen to a ton of music while I'm writing. The Lighthouse, I listened to less music and I had like a, a sort of soundscape of you know, what it sounded like on the, on, on the island uh, when I was writing. And if you, you know, are in my office, uh, you know, in the production office, like I'm constantly playing music in the van on the scouts. Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, but but you know, uh, yes. And and then and and the Northman, I think, was the first movie that I played music uh, on on set. 
Yeah, because we we had a lot more stage work, and it was also uh, a lot of scenes that were very physical and less dialogue driven. So it was like nice to have that music in, in uh, around. Um, for that I reason. imagine everyone is curious now, and so am I. What kind of music? Well, I mean, for the Northmen, I was listening to tons of like shitty Viking music for like years, and you know, and uh, so it, it all it always kind of depends. And for the previous, um, yeah, I mean, uh, for the Lighthouse, there was a lot of sea shanties. Uh, I, you know, obviously, when it came to the score, I was listening to very different things. But during production, uh, there was lots of uh, you know, drinking and the fisherman cottage with sea shanties. Uh, uh, and uh, and act, it's funny, you know, I listened to a lot of 17th century music when I was working on uh, the, the Witch, but I, but ironically, you know, Puritans were not really very fond of, of music. Once you are finished with the respective movies, are you finished with listening to those styles of music as well, or is that something that would stick with you? Yeah, pretty much done. Certainly with the Viking music, I'll tell you that. <clears throat> um, when I was watching your older interviews and, and stuff, uh, I got the impression that you seem not to like when asked to dive into the ideology or the messages of the movies, but at the same time, uh, you do such an extensive research for the films, meaning uh, you, at a certain point, like have to arrive at a moment where you would think for yourself, like for example, why was it only women that were attributed supernatural qualities and punished afterwards? Is that something that's important for you? Let it, let us let alone whether it ends up in the movies, like directly. I, I, you know, I'm just trying to tell a story, and uh, but obviously. And, and I'm trying to stay in, in as, a, as a writer, like in the world in which I'm writing, and all I'm trying to do is like articulate the mindset of the of the people in that period in the story. Obviously, it's it's impossible to present that without judgment, but I'm trying to. It's impossible to do it, uh, but also, like, you know, one hopes that, uh, you know, like I I don't live in in a hermetically sealed alchemical laboratory doing this for myself. Like, I'm out in the world, I'm talking to other people, collaborating with other people, so these stories have to work for other people. If this movie only appear, appealed to 19th century lighthouse keepers, it would have a very small audience. So, <laughs> so hopefully, it, you know, I, I'm somehow touching the zeitgeist uh, without trying to, you know. Your very early artistic years are linked to a theater, and I believe that's still an interest of yours that you have maintained. Uh, I think before casting, for example, Ethan Hawke in The Northman, you've seen him on stage, if I'm not wrong. Uh, how many of the casting ideas are yours? And generally said, what is the casting process for your movies? I mean, they, yeah, I mean, the Witch, I was really lucky because finally, once I found financiers, they let me cast whoever I wanted. Uh, and then, uh, you know, w this was also very easy because I wanted these two guys. And so I, so the financiers weren't going to object to that. It was just a matter of, you know, making sure that Willem and Rob said yes. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I th certainly... Uh, you know the, the the studio has a has a voice uh, as far as cast, and we have to like ag agree on things. Um, uh, but uh, but you know th these are these you know yeah. I mean ultimately it's my decision. Like no one wants me to make a film with actors that don't make sense for the story. At what stage do the movies get? Tested? Although although. You know, some of the films I didn't make, I didn't make because I was in a situation where at the studio where we couldn't agree uh, on casts that work for the story. So I didn't make the films. Mm. Are you hoping to go back to those projects? I imagine you would. We'll see. Yeah. Um, at uh, what stage do the movies get tested by audiences? And maybe give us an insight into the whole procedure because that's something which is not so common, like for European cinema. It's not ex it's 
it happens, but not so often as with studio productions. Okay, so I'm not against, uh, you know, test screenings at, at all. And, I, and in fact, on The Witch, I invited lots of audiences of kind of like erudite people who I thought might see the movie, not like just general people, but like people who were into cinema and psychologists and painters and musicians or whatever. I had a lot, I did, I did like 14 of them or something, just to, to, because I wanted a lot of feedback and I wanted to like understand what was working. I wanted to make sure that, you know, the film didn't suck. And, and it, was, it was helpful to have this, this feedback. I think, but, but when, with, with The Northman, it was the, it was the first film where I had like traditional studio um, test screenings and uh, where, you, you know, they bring in an audience and, and they fill out cards and they rate all this stuff and whatever. It, like, did I learn things from it? Absolutely. Like, uh, do I regret that we did it? Absolutely not. Like, it, it, like the, it, the, it made the film better. I think the, the only problem I have with it is that, like, any statistician will tell you that there's absolutely not enough data for the numbers to mean anything. And the way that the studio... Uh, system works is that they hold these numbers to like a high regard, kind of because this is the only thing they have. But 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 if you know if it wasn't if if the numbers didn't matter to the studio, I think the whole thing is would be great otherwise because uh, because those numbers just you can't really and there's just not enough data for them to really mean anything. But but it's always good to have feedback and kind of uh, see what's working, what's not working in general. All right, uh, thank you for this part of the talk. I think it's time to uh, take a breath and watch the trailer for The Lighthouse, and then we shall continue. All right, uh, our second guest tonight is a cinematographer whom Robert, I guess, has worked with on every film since 2008. Please welcome Academy Award nominee of The Lighthouse, uh, Jaren Blaschke. To start with, what are the benefits of uh, having the uh, Academy Award nomination in your CV? Uh, I, I tend to just stick with him, but <laughs> you know. You've been working together for almost, or well, over 14 years now. Uh, maybe if we take The Lighthouse as, a, as an example, because that's the movie that most of the people have just freshly seen, whether for the first time or uh, repeatedly. Give us an insight into how the two of you, because you are really close collaborators, how the two of you work together on the example of The Lighthouse. <laughs> Cheers. Um, no, it's nice because um, just as a friend, I get to see things earlier than a cinematographer might generally. So um, the seeds for ideas begin early, like with The Lighthouse. I mean, it began before The Witch, maybe? You know, it's just sort of like, well, oh, here, here, here's this, I, I didn't even read the script, it's just sort of, here's, here's a movie, it's gonna be boxy, it's gonna be black and white, it takes place, you know, at this time, and, you know, and you get to work on it uh, in, the long, in the long term and think about textures and how to best uh, convey that, you know? Uh, I don't know if I had a, a typical cinematographer's prep, whether uh, it would have been orthochromatic or that aspect ratio or, you know, uh, a third to half of the ideas would even be in there. So um, that's, that's the advantage. Having mentioned the aspect ratio, for example, um, what uh, circumstances or what context do you take into account when deciding the aspect ratio for the movies? Because there's a variety of things. At the same time, uh, there is like there are more established ratios that are being used, which is not your case usually. 
So what are the what are the thoughts behind that? I mean, kind of. I mean, you know, we have to we have to work within a certain system. I mean, generally, I mean, uh, I know Rob wants to shoot everything one through three, and kind of so do I. You know, I mean, I'm more of a this is my confession, but I, I'm more of a I tend to be slightly more of a, a photography fan than a cinema fan. Sorry, but it's um, but it's like photographs tend to not be widescreen. And uh, I mean, it's great when you want to do something modernist, you know, like uh, you want to do something widescreen and, and uh, really modernist, but that's not, that's not a Rob Eggers film, so. Um, I mean, like we, I would have wanted to have hypothetically shot the Northmen, like, you know, in 133, but it, we felt that it was better for the landscapes to have something wider. Uh, but we, but but Viking architecture tends to be very vertical, the interiors. So we felt like two to one was like a compromise that you know we could deal with. Yeah, it was gonna be it was gonna be two to one or or one eight five, but it was just like groups of people. And I mean, at least for me, it was like there there is like a little bit of classic art, you know, a little bit of Renaissance art. That's uh, you know, the Last Supper is two to one, you know. And there are certain things that, you know, just had, like, it's so precious and stupid, but it's just, you know, there's uh, there's something about two to one where you see two squares side by side that just felt good within, you know, this person's taste. And me. then, and, and the <clears throat> the lighthouse, I presumed would be one, three, three, and Jaron said, like, ha half joking, like, you know, how about 119 to one? And I leapt at it because I'm, like fond of these early sound films. And and then uh, I was kind of scared that maybe we couldn't quite do it and mm. revisited a bunch of films in this aspect ratio and felt like we could. But then I, and then when I, re, when I saw, I hadn't seen it before, I saw Pops' uh, Kameradschaft. And that's like, it takes place uh, in a mine. So you have these like super cramped interiors and then the smokestacks that were very vertical and it felt like, okay, this is actually the perfect aspect, aspect ratio to tell this story. How about that? You know? yeah. In fact, I was just I, about to ask whether um, other older movies or aesthetics of, uh, let's say, silent cinema are ever an influence on the final decision. I mean, uh, certainly for Rob, and he's my educator, you know, on, on, a, pro on a per project basis, I, you know, kind of, it almost feels like, you know, you're such a fan of 133, it's like, well, what's the closest thing we can get to that? You know, like even this movie, you know, I guess I can't divulge what the aspect ratio is, but, you know, let's say The Witch, it's like, we can't do 133, so what's the closest thing that they'll let us do, which is 166, you know? I mean, it's, that's true to an extent, I feel. Yeah. Yeah, but also, I think, you know, as we've said, like, in, like, Throne of Blood is like a perfect 133 movie, and I'm certainly not complaining <laughs> about Seven Samurai's photography, but there is some time when you feel mm. like, you know, maybe Kurosawa could sure. wanted to like, <laughs> and, yes. and, and with some of the scenes with the family, because uh, there's, you know, like, you know, all the family members in The Witch, mm. that maybe 166 was a nice, yeah, so I, maybe it was the right choice. Yeah, I think, I, I think that was it, you know, eight years on. Um, and the, the other thing that's interesting is that, you know, the Northman was two to one. There was a, there was a choice at that point to do, you know, uh, shoot anamorphically, but it just felt like it was too tied to films, for me anyway. And, and I think that uh, it just has a, a, such a distinct uh, fingerprint that uh, something a little more neutral that you could sort of make, um, I don't know, just universally tied to, to art that, uh, that Spherical made sense for Rob. And I, I do love the anamorphic format, but I just feel like for Rob Eggers, it's not, not appropriate. Uh, you had to shoot The Witch on digital due to financial reasons, I believe, but you used other, uh, let's say, technical means to um, enhance the atmosphere that you wanted for the, for the movie. Could you maybe introduce the, the, the technical aspect of, of this? What were the actual things you did to make the movie look the way it looks? 
I don't know, do we do anything? I don't know. It's just. I mean, you, you used older glass. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, it, that was it. Just really. pretty standard now. Sure. It now it's sounds just like, standard, but I was fairly, uh, fairly. You know, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, interesting. It's just, every, everyone's doing it. It's kind of, um, yeah, maybe the time. I mean, it just, that those particular lenses, uh, those Cook Pancros that are so ubiquitous now, it's just, you know, but they do have sort of a, around, things go out of focus in sort of a, a round way. It felt like a, um, a crystal ball, and if you're going to use a clean format uh, like the Alexa that uh, let's just go go in for making it look like glass, you know, and having that sort of round glass porthole um, look. So, yeah. Uh, would you say it's an issue for producers in general when a filmmaker asks them to shoot on film? Uh, because uh, I remember uh, speaking with uh, Linur Palmasons, the Icelandic director's producers in Kanluvivari just, just this year, and they were surprised by the question. They said it's no issue for them at all, whether uh, he decides to shoot on film or digital, it just doesn't matter to them. But apparently it, it used to be an issue. Is it still the case? Thankfully, on the past two films, it has not been an issue. But it took a, it took a little while to get there. I mean, there's there's a moment with a lighthouse, but it wasn't that long, you know. I mean, once we made it clear what the what we, the ambition was. The um, um, who who uh, who did that silent film of Fall of the House of Usher? Can anyone name the director? Jean Epstein. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So Jean Jean Epstein. Did a, a, like a lot of nautical films in in Brittany, and uh, and uh, Finitera uh, w has been cleaned up within the past ten years. And there and and then when there was pressure to like shoot the lighthouse digitally, I showed the Blu-ray of of that, and everyone was kind of like, okay, well if it's gonna look like that. Like, I haven't seen that in, you know, 100 years. And, and thankfully, it was a year after the stuff you showed me, which is the hand crank, you know, uh, bathtub developed stuff. So that's good. Uh, what about the importance of handheld cameras as opposed to static cameras? Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're after, I think, I think it's, uh, you know, a, a reaction to a, like a, a lot of things that were happening like in American independent cinema when we first started making films is, is that we're like after a, a kind of craft that is very specific and so we like you know tend to only have stuff on dolly and uh, crane and six and we and whenever we try steady cam we regret it even the last, even the Northman, we tried it, and you know we had. I mean, we had to. There's no choice because it was a remote location, but uh, we regret it. Do you prefer to um, like challenge yourself because um, it's? I, I imagine it's more difficult to do it like this, right? Uh, well, it's for me. You know, I mean, I can say, yeah, it's so much more difficult, but really, it's the crew that has to suffer. So. Um, <laughs> But it's just, it's just something that feels decisive. Um, and also, you know, w when you're on a, even more so than a crane, if you're on a dolly, you know, there's that little knob and there's these little, you know, arrows that mark the height of the camera. And you can say, that's, that's the mark. When the actor's there, you're here. And if the actor's there, I can sort of, you know, peek, peek away from the monitors, uh, they're a little short. You know, and you know, you know what a mark is. You know, um, on a on a Steadicam or even you know, and a lesser extent a crane. It's like, you know, when they've hit when they hit the mark. Otherwise, it's sort of it feels off. I don't know. You know, and otherwise it's like you're on a Steadicam. You know, you go to the operator. It's like it's here. It's not here. It's like well, what is what the hell is that? But the, then the the other challenge is, and I don't think we always succeed. We certainly don't in the Northman plenty. Is is you you know you don't want to have it feel pickled. You want to have yeah. it feel uh, alive, even sure. with the precision of the camera work. We do not always succeed. 
No. But but you you know that's that you, you're trying for that, and I think and I think you know uh, it, it is easier to you know probably succeed to have life with uh, you know a handheld camera, but it's it's not uh, like we're after a, a golden fish that's harder to catch. Because yeah, and it's hard, which is alluring. Maybe we can take a look at some more uh, storyboard examples, this time from The Lighthouse. Um, you mentioned, Robert, that uh, for The Witch, the storyboarding was your work. Uh, what, about, what about The Lighthouse, and um, why did you decide to uh, take on board other, other people for this process? Uh, you know, wanted someone better. We also had, uh, we, we had more, we needed more storyboards because so so now it's like okay so now we're talking about anytime there's a visual effect anytime there's an animal anytime there's storm effects anytime there's a boat and all of a sudden we're like oh fuck like there's a lot of storyboards for the lighthouse you know yeah and you know it's it's not a huge movie but it's still a, a step up for us so any any assurance or any planning that we can any preparation that we can involve uh is is welcome so yeah <clears throat> So, here are some storyboards. I forgot these existed because I figured the Northlands when we started. But and I think like this this sequence is actually really close to the movie. But looking through these, some of this, these storyboards are pretty uh, loose compared to like like they don't match the final frames a ton uh, compared to what we're doing now. Like. Um, the, the the current um, storyboards are very 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 close to like the finished film. Uh, given how uh, much thought you put into the details in your movies, is it ever frustrating for you when people absolutely miss it? Do you like watch the movie with audiences and think, oh, there's this uh, historic detail that I'm proud of, I'm proud of having the movie, and nobody notices? No, I mean, I, th I think, um, I don't expect everyone to see all this stuff, and it's, but you just, hopefully, you just, like, sense it, and you feel like you can believe in it, and you can, and, and that helps you invest in the story more, because you, like, somehow, it doesn't feel off. I think, um, I think that, like, a lot of times with period movies, particularly period TV shows, people just put up a lot of period set dressing of, like, barrels and buckets and baskets and stuff. You know, it's all old stuff. Uh, but, you know, we really tried, like, you know, me and Craig, try to figure out, like, it, it, you know, it's not just, like, uh, a, an outbuilding. It's a threshing barn that they use to, th to thresh uh, their, their grain. And so these are the tools that are in here, and this is the kind of barley. And, you know, and, and I think that, that, you know, is any, how many people in the audience are going to say that's a threshing barn, like, you know, four. But, but everyone else is just going to kind of feel like it works. Now, at the same time, to, to like, like, the only time that I've been, like, disappointed uh, of people not noticing it was actually with some of the historians that worked on uh, uh, the Northmen, like Neil, Neil Price, one of the star archaeologists, like, had seen the movie four times, and he was like, I only realized that you, like, did the burial mound, like, based on the Osseberg burial. I had no idea, and I've watched the film four times, you know, and that was kind of shocking to me, but... Yeah, but if it was some rando, you wouldn't mind as much, right? Sure. You know. I mean, as far as how it applies to the design of a movie, uh, I'm sure you feel the same, but, like, I don't give a shit, you know? I think if you feel... I, the hope is that you feel the rigor and you feel that people cared and you feel like you're seeing this right now and you're not seeing these other things until later for a reason, you know, and that, um, that that's, that's important, you know, rather than the, um, you know, the, the precious film people appreciating it. Now maybe time has come uh, for an excerpt, or rather three excerpts from The Lighthouse, which we are going to show. We're going to show the, the, the longer version that we've prepared, which takes about seven minutes. It's uh, going to be three separate scenes, uh, two shorter, one a bit longer. 
And so there will be a short uh, break in between these three scenes. And once it's finished, we'll get and um, discuss the uh, approaches behind those and carry on with the talk. So if we could have the screening, please. I hope it was louder than that when you watched the film. <laughs> Pattinson's like last scream is supposed to be just so loud that you're about to leave the theater and then it ends. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons uh, I picked these three respective parts of the movie is that they all include the, or rather begin with the scene in the corridor. And I remember myself uh, being in the cinema years ago when the film premiered and watching the movie and uh, being really impressed by how you manage to shoot the same locations in a very different manner or rather a subtly different manner. And having the occasion now, I would like to ask you both perhaps uh, if you could give us an insight into when the film is being shot and you know it's going to the camera, it's going to pan through the corridor, the same corridor as a number of times in the movie, but you do, you do it differently. What, idea, what are the ideas behind that? Uh, does it reflect the mental state of the characters? Do you know at the shooting stage it's going to look different every single time? Do you do that in post-production? Yeah, I mean, yeah, cer cer certainly... Uh... Even if the, the shot seems objective, our intention is always to make it somehow the, the protagonist's experience or whoever seen point of view it is. It, you know, we might be going through our own uh, mental acrobatics to say that it is subjective, but that's how we feel about it. Uh, but and, and certainly uh, just knowing that we're using one location for a, a two-hour movie that really should have been probably 90 minutes because it's two guys in a lighthouse, we're trying to figure out, yeah, like we don't want every shot to look exactly the same. And if there is repetition, like that repetition needs to be on uh, serve a purpose. It needs to show the monotony of... Uh, the dinner table. Right. It needs to show the monotony of, of their life or it needs to be somehow a motif that we're developing. Word. <laughs> what about the technical part of that? What does it take? No, I mean, I, I hope that the stuff that makes it different is also just written in, you know, and that's, um, that's a really privileged and uh, rarefied relationship I have is that, you know, I can get in on, you know, I can I can read something early. So uh, if something is written, it's different because it's a night scene in a hallway, you know, versus, you know, which is already there, but, you know, maybe there's something that's like, well, what, you know, what if it were whatever, this sort of weather or this sort of time of day or whatever, you know, there's there's the opportunity for that. But I think I think Rob has a sense for this already. You know, I don't know that we've seen that that corridor uh, before in the movie at that, you know, at night. So what does that, what does that feel like? And, you know, it's a dream, so we add a little, you know, atmosphere. I mean, these are all easy, easy things. I can't take too much credit. Uh, I remember when uh, Belatar, the Hungarian director, was at a film festival and he was asked about the gloomy atmosphere in uh, one of his movies and what it takes. A, a, kind of a, a general reference for this movie, by the way. You know, obviously. Claro. <laughs> yeah. Chica. Yeah. And, and he was asked, uh, what does it take uh, to create such a, such a heavy, encompassing, uh, gloomy atmosphere? And he said, oh, we just waited for the weather to be fucked. Um, I imagine when you are shooting a studio movie, you cannot do that, really. No, I, no, no. I mean, we, we, we went to uh, the, I mean, the, you know, we we shot on the this rocky peninsula in in Nova Scotia where the weather was horrible like almost the whole time, and 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 actually the bad news was it's horrible. The good news is it's fucking horrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so so I mean you know even if we weren't like inspired by 
Bellatar, we got Bellatar every day, like, you know, um, which is great. Um, and, and actually the, the scenes with the most extreme weather, like, were real. It was often when it's just like light rain that it's uh, movie rain. Uh, but, but the really horrible stuff was, w w you know, like when there, two of them are standing waiting for the tender to come with the sacks over their shoulders. And then, I mean, that was just the weather that day. Um, and uh, obviously when Rob's like taking the, <clears throat> the boat out into the ocean, the waves are crashing, like that was simulated as not to murder Robert Pattinson. Um, but, um, but yeah, uh, you know, yeah, on stage, like, you know, we're on stage, but, but I think with, you know, it's easy enough especially with black and white, to make it seem... Yeah, let's do another one of those. Yeah. Every movie should be black and white in one three. Kind of, yeah. You know. it's just... um, by now, everyone has noticed that you are obviously a film enthusiast, uh, a film fan who watches loads of movies. Do you think it's necessary for an active filmmaker to keep track of both what's going on and to be aware of the historical context as well? I know it's probably not it's probably not necessary, but I try. You know, I, I'm not doing as good of a job keeping track of contemporary films um, simply because I'm working more. Thank goodness, and please don't let it end. Uh, whoever's in charge, but um, but uh, and also with COVID and everything, it's just you know, like I like to see movies in the cinemas and, and I'm traveling around Europe and things like, you know, not, everything opens here late. Like all my friends in the, the mm -hmm. States and the UK are like, oh, have you seen this, have you seen that? I'm like, no, I can't get them here. I need a VPN. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but, you know, I, I, I try, but, but, the, but, Frank, but, but, but I'm, I'm often, you know, watching like obscure Soviet movies rather than looking for new stuff because it just kind of is what I'm into, you know. I can confirm that. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, he, he, I don't know if you've, he hasn't read much, from what I can tell, of the 20th century. It's like he just would rather read more of the 19th century. So, you know, he's, you just gonna watch more of the good stuff or take a chance on what's out now, right? Sure. <laughs> Uh, the Witch premiered at Sundance. Uh, the Lighthouse was in Cannes, and uh, you get invited to obviously to a number of film festivals. Is that an occasion for you just to present your own movies, or also perhaps catch up with what's going on? It's it's really hard when you have uh, like when I was I had short films and like and they didn't and, and no one cared. I got to see tons of movies. It was like the best. But yeah, when, when you're at a festival with a film, it's hard to see films, which is a shame. Like all the cool films that can, the year that I was there, I saw much later. Um, having mentioned Sundance, uh, what is uh, your perspective on the F Sundance Film Festival's role as an institution for American filmmakers? Because I imagine for film fans over here, it would be the uh, number one reference film festival in the US, but I would like to know your, your perspective into that. Some people see it as a, as a starting point, like the ideal starting point. I mean, it's also, the, I mean, sorry, but like the odds are just so impossible to get into it too. I just remember, you know, cause I, I got out of school in 2000, you know, and I didn't get it, I didn't have a film in Sundance until 2007 and they were short films, you know, and I didn't have a feature there until The Witch. You know, so um, it's hard because like that's that's it. Uh, you feel like you know in the states, uh, and it's just such a. I, I was in the director's lab, which felt like a bloody miracle. But you know, um, yeah, there's there's little else uh, it feels like out there. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for that experience. So I'm like beyond grateful. Uh, like just. To get into the festivals, the odds are yeah. absurd. You know, you mentioned that there is no Ministry of Culture in the U.S. that would support, let's say, young or any kind of uh, filmmakers. What about the other institutions, like private institutions, maybe linked to film festivals that would do that? It, are there any? 
Yeah, but it's not, it's not, there, there definitely is, but it's not, it's just, it's, it's not the same, you know, I mean, you know, you're supposed to pick yourself up by your own bootstraps in America. Yeah, I mean, Sundance kind of has a monopoly, you know, and it's, again, just the odds, man. But th yeah, but there is, I mean, it's not, it's not that there isn't stuff, but. Um, connected to having films presented at these large film events, it, a part of, this, part of it is being in the spotlight as well as a director. Is that a role that you are comfortable with? Is that something that you enjoy to a certain extent, or is it just a necessity for you which helps boost the, the final, final movie that you've created? Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, I, you know, no, I don't like being in the spotlight, and then the, the New Yorker article that you've referenced a couple times, it was, it's very fine, it's a very fine, it, you know, Sam did a great job, but it is way more personal information than I feel like needs to be out there about me. And, and that is strange. And it's strange, you know, it's strange. Uh, but, you know, uh, obviously, if you become some kind of a fixture, even if it's in uh, the, the s s small world of, of, you know, director-driven cinema, like, it helps me make more films. So, so, it, it, so therefore, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a high-class problem. Let me put it to you that way. Has it changed throughout the years? Are you more accustomed to this part of your job, basically? Or is it still the same? It's still weird, but yeah, I'm more accustomed to it. And, and, and uh, to be fair, like this kind of a thing I kind of do enjoy. I, you know, I started as, as an actor, so I like secretly am a, a bit of a ham at times. So, it's in, so having a, an audience is enjoyable. If I slide into uh, to the slightly more superficial side of things, uh, do you take any pride or pleasure in the fact that you have basically discovered the actress Anya Taylor-Joy in The Witch and she is on a great career span now? Or uh, that pe when people tell you that you are one of the directors, let's say, alongside David Cronenberg, who's actually made people realize how good an actor Robert Pattinson is, is there any, is there any pride and joy for you in that? Uh, sure. <laughs> and I think this is the ideal moment to uh, play the trailer for The Northman, and then we will open the floor for your questions. When we, when we finished The Northman, the composer said he never wanted to hear another drum again. Yeah, we're going to rob you of one of your mics, uh, which you are going to use for the audience questions. Uh, so if you have any, please raise your hand and then wait for the microphone to be delivered to you. Uh, for practical reasons, unfortunately, we cannot take the mic uh, onto the balcony. So the option for the balcony people is to shout the questions, but we'll leave that for the second part. We'll start down here, so perhaps like in the very first row, please. And yeah, wait for the mic, and then you can ask your question. Good evening. Uh, currently, there is a Czech film in cinemas that was shot entirely on iPhone 12. And in my opinion, it looks uh, actually pretty cool. And I'd like to ask you whether you think this might be the future of cinema. Probably. <laughs> it's not in the, probably in the future of our cinema, but like, that's cool. No. <laughs> yep. Oh, wait. Um, I have a question about the Northman, because um, apparently you were forced to uh, shoot the vast majority of the movie in Northern Ireland instead of Iceland. Uh, because, of, because of COVID, and um, I can only imagine how devastating it must have been to learn that you wouldn't be able to, to film, to, to make the movie where you wanted it to be. Um, uh, how, how did you deal with that? Um, like, um, 
learning that uh, my movie is probably ruined because you know I don't have the Icelandic landscapes. Uh, did you go back to the script and uh, rewrite certain scenes so that they could uh, work with Nor Northern Ireland too, or did you just rely on visual effects and uh, hope for the best? The latter, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, basically, uh, we we knew that we were going to shoot the majority of the film in Northern Ireland, no matter what just because shooting in Iceland is very expensive unless you're making like a kind of under $5 million movie. Um, why that is is complicated, but in any case, so we, so we knew that like Fjolnir's farm was gonna have to be somewhere in, in Ireland. Like we, we knew that. Um, but, but we didn't expect that we weren't gonna be able to do any of the principal photography there. So, so, just, so, so basically there's a lot of, which I don't really like, but we just had to do it, you know, foreground, is Ireland and like midbound, midground or background is a plate of Iceland. The the, the like a, an example. I won't do more than one, but you know if you recall, I don't know uh, when when Alex and Annie and the other like enslaved Slavs like go to the come to arrive at the beach. We found the most Icelandic looking beach we could find in Ireland. Uh, and then we put a plate of Iceland in the background, and then we turned the sand black with CG, you know. So, uh, and, I, and I think it works, but it's certainly not how I would like to do things. But we just we didn't have a choice. Well, it worked. Uh, I've been to Iceland. It looks just like in the movie. So, good job. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. There's much that we're going to shoot. There's always going to be a small amount of material we're going to shoot in Iceland anyway. I mean, the farm was always going to be Northern Ireland, uh, you know, with some background plates. So there's, I think it was probably a 10% compromise ultimately, you know. And then we went, all oh, right, 20%. I usually you're the optimist. So yeah, it's um, yeah a couple scenes. And there's there's one scene that's you know is almost as good that we shot in uh, Northern Ireland, a reshot when we went to Iceland the next year uh, for reasons that had nothing to do with COVID. So. All right, could we move the mic? Yep. Could you please tell about the seagulls? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so basically, uh, we we on set. Um, Pattinson was like, okay, the seagulls that are just like generally flying around all over the place were seagulls that were on uh, Cape Forshoe where we shot it, and we had um, an animal specialist who basically put chum like all over the buildings and so the seagulls would just like flock around and that was all 90% real. You have to explain what that is perhaps. Oh, chum is like, you know, fish guts and blood. Um, so then, uh, but, but, but Rob was acting across from a puppet um, that had like a puppeteer going like, caw, caw, like, uh, <laughs> and then we shot blank plates of those uh, background uh, plates of, of, of all that stuff. And then afterwards, we went to Pinewood in London and worked with the only three uh, trained uh, 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 gulls um, in the film industry. Um, <laughs> uh, and they were amazing. I mean, they, they were really amazing. Like the, when the gull jumps on the windowsill, pecks three times and flies off, like that's all real. Uh, but, you know, but obviously when Rob kills the gull, uh, you know, the, when he's like handling the gull, that's like a, a Franken gull of like a puppet and a real gull. And then when he smashes it on the cistern, that's obviously, you know, a puppet. You should tell, you should tell, them, why they're only, you should tell them why they're only three, you know, because they're being spaced out. Yeah, so basically herring gulls, even though they're like, Basically, rats are endangered and protected, uh, or maybe not. They're maybe not endangered, but they're certainly protected. And so these are these these were the, the, like these uh, gulls were uh, rescue birds. And so like so being a rescue bird, training them is something that actually gives them something that makes them like not like clinically depressed. Uh, so so these they, so they were kind of like grandfathered in as like the last the last of the gulls. Yeah, okay. Uh, you mentioned about uh, Soviet films. What is your like favorite? 
Uh, I mean, that's imp sort of impossible, but, you know, uh, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I've, you know, Andre Rublev, Mary Poppins, uh, Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, <laughs> The Elephant Man, um, there's a few. Okay, the second row, please. Hi. Uh, I rewatched The Witch recently, and uh, after a, a while, and it surprised me how similar the ending felt to the ending of The Lighthouse. And I, and I swear I wasn't looking for it, but, and they are obviously very different films, but uh, kind of in The Lighthouse you have the lantern room where Young is not allowed to enter, right? And in, uh, even in The Witch, Thomasin might not be so much into the whole witchcraft business. She's, uh, there's a clear distinction between, between the bubble of order and Christian family and like the uncertain, unknowable chaos of the woods. And then both films, uh, when things escalate and everyone ends up dead, then we kind of descend into the night, right? And then the protagonist like crosses some kind of a threshold uh, into what seems like uh, like orgasmic agony. And uh, my question is, if I am not totally off by this... Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and then there's a, you know, they, everyone's naked and dead, like, you know, I, in all my movies in the end. And, and <laughs> I think, you know, there's, there's very few storytellers like in human history that are a Shakespeare that have like a zillion stories to, to tell. Like, you know, if you're lucky, you're Charles Dickens and you just tell the same fucking story over and over and over again. Okay, it just, okay, I think it's it just, uh, I don't know, the, 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 like the, the point of no entry, the decision to like go beyond the threshold is it's just, but, but is it I, is it like a mo I, motif that it's you're but honestly in? like I'm not like you know like after the fact I'm aware of it but when I'm writing it I'm just writing it and I think I've written something new and then I discover that I don't have anything to say but one thing so it's okay thanks <laughs> yeah, there was a question in the first row we'll proceed to the further don't worry. Good evening. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, when you are creating a story like The Lighthouse or Northman, uh, which I would describe as mind-bending or your life use scrambling, a psychological roller coaster, uh, with so many questions like, is Willem Dafoe character mad? Is Robert Pattinson character crazy, or are they, are they both mad? It, are they still in Canada, or is Canada even real? Um, uh, so my question is, and I don't want you to tell us the answer, but um, do you have your own definitive story, what is real and what is not? Yeah, I, with with the Northman, my brother Max and I like had versions of the script that were very clear and then we spent a lot of time like trying to make them make it more confusing and, and and trying to you know follow the mindset of Pattinson's character and his descent into madness and create something that was deliberately hard to follow but we felt that we needed to know all the answers to the questions uh, in order to do that properly uh, the Northman like, you know, I've talked about how it's like weird in a lot of interviews, but I only mean weird compared to like Gladiator. But I was, you know, Shona and I were just trying to tell a story normally, I, you know, and apparently we didn't, I don't know, I, you know, but, um, but, but uh, I think with the Northmen, it's just basically, again, about our, trying to articulate the mindset of the people, like, you know, uh, Odin and, you know, living mound dwellers and Valkyries like exist for uh, these, 
you know, 10th century Nordic people, and so they're real, you know? So, so, so there is no distinction between uh, reality and the other world, certainly in that film, for me. Uh, and my second question is, can you give me number of Anya Taylor-Joy? <laughs> okay. Um, third row, please, on the side. Hello, good evening. Um, I have a kind of a different question, I guess. I'd like to ask you about um, what methods you use when you work with actors. If you have a specific way of uh, interpreting your vision or explaining uh, what would you like to achieve when working with them? Um, I think, you know, every actor needs different things. Uh, and uh, with, I mean, with The Witch, it was, you know, everyone was very different. You know, it was Anya's first real thing, and she first real film, and she needed a, a lot of attention and like care. Uh, you know, the youngest boy, uh, uh, he, you know, needed to be protected from what was going on, and so a lot. You know, he he was given technical directions of like breathe faster and look over here, and he didn't. You know, like there was no like real acting involved. You know, Ralph uh, it, it, it abhors method acting and likes to be like completely technical. Uh, you know, Kate Dickey, if you give her too many marks, she gets f flustered. So, you know, everyone demands something different. And so you, I have to change what I'm doing uh, depending on who the actor is. That said, also, you know, actors, that the actors that I'm gravitated uh, towards and the actors that are gravitating towards me know that in order to, if, if you're working with a writer director um, or, you know, like an auteur film, whatever that is, uh, that you need to, you need to bend to their way of working somewhat or the film's not going to work, um, you know. And so Pattinson and Defoe like really needed to trust me, but both, but they, but they had very different ways of working. So uh, you know, and uh, and it was it was not, and, and the shoot was difficult because of it. It was enjoyable, and it, it made the film better, but uh, but it was but it was difficult. And I think um, you know, yeah, I don't know. Uh, this I mean, I, this this could go on for 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 a long time. But I would I, I would say that like. Something that I particular I don't like to do too much table work. Like let's like sit down, talk about our characters and our backstories, whatever. Like it's not that that's not important, but um, but I feel like doing, getting on your feet and doing is like the the best thing. And 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 the other thing that is and, and that's not one one thing that's maybe more unique to how we work is that the the rehearsal period tends to be a lot about orienting yourself to like the camera movement and uh, you know and that can be frustrating like you know Anya started on the witch and so when we came back together on the Northmen she was very used to that and she now says that when she's working with a director who like doesn't have like a, a plan for the camera like she feels a little bit frustrated I'm sure she's fine with it, but but you know this is what she's used to. Uh, but I I know Alex, who who I'm sure if he were on stage now would tell you he enjoyed the process of making the Northman. He felt like he was being treated like a robot for the first couple of weeks. Um, so um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the rehearsals. I mean, it's to the point where I get uncomfortable, you know, uh, just because. But Rob's. The one to say it that you know uh, this is you're going to be here and you're going to open up this way and you're going to go here and you know this is this is uh, what the scene is so um, I'm always surprised they're on board. So. I mean, if something if something does not work, then you have to change it. 
because, you know. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move further back with the questions, please, so that we give the people in the back a chance as well. If I can just ask, if you could hand back the microphone once you ask the question, so we make it a bit faster afterwards. Sure. Thanks. Uh, hi, um, I'm a recent graduate of Charles University here in Prague, and my bachelor's thesis was about a possible existentialist view of the lighthouse. <laughs> so first, thank you for helping me get a diploma. <laughs> and second, um, I know that you've talked about how your films resist having one overarching message. You have a lot of um, inspiration and ideas uh, in your work. And I am wondering when you watch clips now, when you watch the film now, uh, what sticks out to you? And I know you've mentioned that like the audience interpretation of toxic masculinity is something that you didn't have in mind when you made the film, but you see it now. So I wonder if, what are some of your own ideas you see in the work now? And what are some maybe new ideas that you see? Uh, I, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't, I, like, I mean, like, that's a really good question, but, like, you know, I, but the thing is, like, I'm not, I'm really trying not to revisit my movies because I don't really want to watch them. Like, you know, I, I didn't, cause, because, like, I, I'm sure this sounds precious, but, like, but I'm, I'm seeing the faults in them, and so it frustrates me. But, but I think to try to answer your question more fully, um, or at all, it, it is in the release of the film that I start to understand like what I've made, you know, um, like this gentleman who is talking about like the ends of the witch and the lighthouse being similar and crossing the threshold and stuff. You know, it's like other people are pointing that stuff out to me, you know, and uh, and and then I I see it and I don't. I mean, you know, I got like I, I got two. I got like creepy, stalkery, weird stuff, and I had to like make it so you can't contact me any, anymore. But like, when, but when The Witch came out, like, you could. And I had, you know, uh, Satanists saying, like, you totally, like, we're on the same page, like, totally get that. <laughs> and, then, and I had, like, I had a Calvinist minister say, but, you know, we're on the same page, like, you totally get me. And that's, that's enjoyable. Great. Thank you. Um. Good evening. I have a question about Lighthouse. So why did you use so many uh, shot, reverse shot, with rather few blocking and movement? Uh, just because there was a lot of dialogue, and I felt like we needed the flexibility to, 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 to do that. Uh, and, and we would have just been, like, you know, as much as, as much as we herald, like, not doing traditional coverage, uh, we felt like you know a lot of these scenes like just just needed a traditional shot reverse shot to uh, make it work. But I know, I mean, Jaron. No, uh, I think I think we're learning because I um, I, I think at this point, uh, I mean, the North has a whole different um, sort of planning of of blocking, and I think you know the new movie, even though it, it is more dialogue heavy than the Northman, you know, I. I don't know. There's two people sitting at a table. What are you gonna, you know, what are you gonna do? So, I think um, I think going forward, there's there's an opportunity to sort of move people around. I mean, I'm still always um, inspired by Tarkovsky, and you know, he would have people circling around each other for no fucking reason. But you know, but when you're watching, it's just like, yeah, he's walking around. But if you think about it, it's like, oh, that's that's how he gets the shot and the reverse shot and the two shot and then the long shot and the over and, and everything else uh, seamlessly. And um, that continues to inspire me anyway. And, and so, yeah, I think, I think that's something that we want to, like, you know, improve. But I also think, you know, like, I know Jaron doesn't like in The Northmen that, like, the, the, you know, the witch scenes, like, we have all these fluid shots and the witch scenes are shot reverse shot. I think it works fine because it's formulaic because, and, and that's how we do the scene with Bjork, and that's how we do the scene with Ingvar. 
uh, or whatever. But but uh, but and I also have to say that like we had to cut like a third of the dialogue in all those scenes, and had we not had it shot for first shot, we would have been totally screwed. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, maybe please move the mic to this side of the room for a change. Hi. Uh, I'm curious about your um, creative processes with children. I know you talked a little bit about it with uh, actors, but um, how do you like keep a child protected with um, stories so such heavy like uh, like in The Witch, for example, in uh, Caleb's uh, possession? How do you work that? Yeah, well, so so the Caleb possession scene. It, I mean, again, he was he, he he also like couldn't really know what we were doing, and so 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 like you know it would be like you're you know you're panting because you're out of breath and you're really thirsty and like you know and 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 a lot of the movement is just like choreography. So so you just make it up all about technique and you don't have to like go there. Uh, emotionally, because if he he had, if he had known what we were trying to simulate, it would have totally embarrassed and, and shut him down, and, and rightfully so, um, you know. So, what do you tell him when he asks what the story is about? He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I watched recently the the Northman uh, here in Prague. And I kind of noticed that mostly in the beginning, the sound, so the dialogue, was coming a bit out of sync. And I was wondering if that was ADR, uh, and whether it was on purpose, or if it was a technical problem here in, in the... <laughs> well, I've noticed a lot of stuff's been out of sync here, so right. I, uh, it was certainly not intentional. Okay, so, so you would say the Northman was mostly, the, the dialogue was short on on set there was a ton of adr but i don't think that there is sync problems with with that film okay, okay. thanks <laughs> yeah there, there there are there is like alex has like three lines in like the middle of the film that are not that are that where we rewrote things quite a bit which don't sync properly but they're like in the middle of the movie, and that's pretty much it. What's the culture or environment that you try to cultivate on your sets? Misery. <laughs> I, 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 I would like everything to be as familial as possible. I think uh, you, you, know, you, you need to be able to trust each other uh, in order to take risks. Um, and Uh, you know, and this is particular. You know, this is particularly obviously important uh, with 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 the actors. Is it, and and you know, uh, just like with the rest of the crew, I like working with the same actors again whenever I can because we've already built this relationship and we can trust. We already trust each other, and so we can uh, jump jump into it. Um, I mean, it doesn't always. It, you know the the locations that I'm choosing tend to be very grueling, and uh, and the Northman had a lot of challenges with COVID, and and not being able to like spend time together offset. But at the same time, people couldn't see their families, so there's a kind of other kind of closeness. But you know, yeah, I mean, like in a perfect world, it's like the happiest, scrubbliest, doubliest, friendliest, gooeyest environment. But But focused, uh, you know. I don't want to like mess around and, and, and joke around too much. Want to keep things uh, efficient. But you know, again, you, you know, the lighthouse wasn't very cozy. It wasn't very fuzzy. Um, but I think it served the film. Um, all your films have been in like various dialects of English, and I'm wondering what the learning process was like, and if there were moments where you had to like almost teach yourself a new form of English, and then if there were moments on the page where you put something down, and you were like, I don't know what the fuck I'm saying, because it's beautiful, but at times it's, for me as a native English speaker, it's, it is like learning a new language. No, it's, it certainly is learning a new language, and uh, <clears throat> you know, and, I think after The Witch and some other screenplays that haven't been made, like 
I can write pretty fluently in, in early modern English now, uh, but you know, uh, the lighthouse dialects have vanished into the ether, you know. Uh, so it, you know, it, it takes it takes work, but it's 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 fun, you know. And it also challenges you to just think about not just language, but you think about the world differently when you're writing in dialect. So it's in, it's enjoy like sometimes, uh, particularly. Uh, with the Northmen in a, in, a, in a studio environment where I needed to like get certain things across specifically, I had to write things in modern English and, and translate them. Uh, but, but I try when I'm writing in a dialect to write in dialect even as I'm learning it because it does, you know, it, it, it changes the way you just think about the, the world. How much do you allow other people's feedback to change your work versus like, sticking to original ideas and being more stubborn. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 um it's an it's an unanswerable question. I'm I'm sure that this applies to 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 most occupations, but I think, you know, a major part of my job is like when do I listen to all the people around me who know better than what I do and when do I n need to say no, like here we have to reinvent the wheel. The thing is like the director is almost always, uh, you know, the least experienced person on on set because, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm making my fourth feature film, and like that's really great, uh, and that that's impressive, <laughs> you know, and but like every, you know, all, all my collaborators around me have made like tons and tons and tons of movies, you know. Uh, so you really constantly are working with people who know more than you do. So, um, I, you know, it's, you just have to trust your gut. I know it's like so lame and not helpful, but it is, it's, it's the truth. Uh, you talked a little bit about the length of time it takes you to write and produce a script, and especially with The Witch saying that it took five years to produce and that you were... Constantly revising that the whole not, time. No, you know, not full time because, like, I, I was, you know, trying, like, working as a set carpenter and a whatever, you know. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, so I guess my question is just like, did you ever like experience creative burnout along that way, and how did you deal with that? Um, I I haven't. I'm luckily I haven't had a lot of like creative burnout or a writer's block because I'm so research oriented that I can kind of like recharge that. What I have had is like, you suck and you should die because you're terrible. Like, and uh, that, and that's, you know, and that's hard too. <laughs> uh, and, and I think you just have to, you just have to move on, you know? And, and what I always, say is like, well, this may be bad, but I can think of like these 10 movies that people like that are worse. So that helps me keep going. Hello, um, I guess my question would be after being inserted into like a project for so long, how would you say that changes the way you kind of, maybe your perception on the world after, like do you kind of marinate with the work you just made? Is it, you know, thinking about the next project? I know obviously, living off of the art is part of it, but yeah. Uh, I didn't get that, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. I guess it's like, how does, like when you finish a piece of work, how does, does that change the way you see things like in the world or the way you, yeah, your perspective of things? Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I you know, you learn, something from everything that you do and uh, and you also learn a lot from the things that you don't do. I've learned like, like the movies that didn't happen and some of the ones that took a really long time that I thought were gonna happen and died, like I, I learned tons from. Uh, you know, The Northman for, was like such a massive experience for the both of us that, you know, it totally changed how we think about f filmmaking, I, I mean, it's the first time that I feel like I actually am a film director and not like a snake oil salesman pretending I can make a movie. Um, and, and that's, you know, changing how we're making the next one. I mean, 
certainly Nosferatu had it happened the first or second time would be a different movie than it will be when it comes out, just after that experience. Yeah, we have time for three more questions. The first one will be over there. If there's anyone on the balcony, Okay, so we'll move on next to you afterwards. So please, your question over there. All right, so when you were making The Northman, you took historical accuracy very seriously to the point that the Viking ships were made with the same kind of wood that the Vikings would have used at that time. Like, you're making movies for millions of dollars at this point, but do you still come across uh, people who put in money in the project asking you if it's worth spending money on it? And if so, like, what would you be your answer to them? That it's, it's worth your creative vision? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, there's always, there's always a question of budget, you know, there's always the question of budget, and you never have, like, enough money to, to do what you're trying to do, and, uh, and so you always, so you have to find uh, compromises, and, and, cer but certainly, like, you know, you try to use these compromises to, to, like, challenge your way uh, into the storytelling to actually do it better and, and simpler, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's the challenge instead of just like saying, this sucks and it's not what I wanted, you know? Uh, and that's hard and it can, uh, you know, I mean, I, like it seems like, you know, if you're an aspiring filmmaker, I'm crying about like the budget of the Northman, that seems like absurd and I should shut up and I should. Um, but uh, yeah, but also by the way, I think like in, in the press, like things get, like we, you know, most of the ships were made, most of the ship was made out of plywood, you know, like the stuff that you see that's like really important is like made out of the right wood. But again, that's the kind of compromises that you're looking for. That's not, that's not much of one, but, but you know, but you, you think about that. Actually, lumber in <clears throat> Ireland is very expensive. So, so most of the wood in uh, the Northmen was actually plaster. And we and, and Jar and I just kind of asked that the wood that was going to be like closest to camera would be uh, r real wood, but but most of it was uh, plaster. Uh, this is where storyboards come in handy, so people know what exactly will be seen up close and what won't. So, but I also feel like restrictions clarify who you are, and that's um, one of the best lessons. Maybe this gives us a chance just to show the storyboards from the Northman, which we also have and which we haven't shown just for the final minute. And there's a question there, and then the final one will go on to the balcony. Uh, big fan. Uh, my son uh, and myself bonded over The Witch in his teen years. Excellent film. Thank you. Uh, so many of your films are set in the past. I'm so curious uh, what would be a Robert Eggers future film, like a futuristic film? I, 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 uh, I, I would, I'd like to do a sci-fi movie, but every time I've tried to come up with something, it always just seems to be some like rehash of some Polish science fiction. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess it might be a rehash of some Polish science fiction. <laughs> okay, and the final question from the balcony, which you have to shout at me, and I will repeat it for the sake of the recording, so please make it short. Uh, in one interview, you said that you're not interested in making a movie set in the present day, and you're most interested in making a movie set in the past, you're interested in history, and it's something that I deeply like agree with and sympathize with. And I think that movies set in the past are like age better. And I'm just interested in like your reasoning behind it. It's, I mean, it's just, it's just what I'm interested in. I mean, I do agree with you that it's, it is potentially easier to make a, a timeless movie. Like, if it's set in the past, you got to be very careful about particularly like hairdos. Uh, like as much as I love the Godfather movies, those are, those are you know not the hairdos of the period that the movie's taking place in. But uh, whatever, uh, yeah. I uh, but but it's just you know that's that's what I like. I mean the past fairy tales, folk tales, mythology, religion. Uh, you know I would rather uh, write a novel or paint a painting. Not that I could do either one of those things. Uh, about something that I was interested in, then make a film, just to make a film. Um, 
Yeah, and so the, yeah, these, these storyboards are much more you know, detailed, uh, and this is Adam Pescott, who's we're continuing to, to work with. Okay, that's it. Thank you all for joining us and participating, and thank you very much to Jaren and Robert for participating on this Synergy session. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.